welcome to Live Your Dreams on Star TV Network, broadcasting on Channel 21 in Freetown, Sierra Leone. I am Fibian Swill. Live Your Dreams is a program on this station that inspires you to be what you want to be. We bring to you people who have been through struggles in life but have made it through it all. They stand to be very popular people in life, people who are celebrated. All you have to do is work hard, strive for it. There are several people in life who've made it. Talking about people like uh, Oprah Winfrey, talking about people like Bill Gates, people like Ali Dankote who was regarded as the richest black man in existence. And so in this edition, as you can see, we are at a wonderful residence, looking beautiful from the outside, well it does look beautiful also inside. This is the home residence of Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones. He is a special advisor to President Ernest Baikoma, and amongst all the three advisors to the president, he is the only ambassador at large. And the president's special representative at NERC, that's our National Ebola Response Center. We're going to talk to Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones. He's going to talk to us about how he made it through it all in life. Just stay with me and be inspired. Live your dreams. Let's go now as you live your dreams and talk to Professor Monty Jones.
Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones, thank you very much for having us in your house today and being a part of the program. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. Oh, well, it's a pleasure, of course. Mm -hmm. Professor, let's start off by talking about your childhood. Tell us all you remember about your childhood. Well, I must say that this was a long, long time ago, but uh, I believe that uh, my childhood was one of happiness. We were five in, in number. Uh, I was the eldest among five children. And my daddy, Edward Patrick Jones, you know, a Creole, you know, was a marine engineer. So our childhood, he gave us everything that we wanted. My mom, Teresa Jones, um, was the most passionate person that we can think of. She's so very much with the children. Both parents are always with us. They gave us everything that we wanted, even if they have to struggle to get it at that time. So what I could remember vividly is the fact that we were very happy at all times. You know, and even when it was time to go to school, you know, my daddy, being the kind of person that he is, was very particular about prayers, very particular about going to church. We always go to church every day with my parents. Uh, what I mean every day is that eventually myself, my brothers, we had to serve as a master. I was mass serving until I finished my secondary school. <laughs> wow. So every blessed day we go to church. On Sundays we go to church starting at uh, 6 o'clock and don't come home until midday. You know, and, and so it was like that and that was how we grew up. With the Bible right in the center of our table. And uh, so I just remember happiness and I remember that We'll go to Mama, we'll go to Papa and say, we want this, we want that. If they don't have it there, they make sure that we'll get it the next day. Um, Professor, your last name, Jones, it sounds Creole. Mm -hmm. What's your tribe? My tribe is uh, Creole. Okay. My, my, my daddy is a Creole and uh, my mom uh, has got Creole background as well and Nigerian background yeah. to some extent, yes. Mm -hmm. um, let's, so I am a Creole. Yes. Let's talk about your educational background. Mm -hmm. What type of student were you? Type of student? <laughs> I always uh, I say that uh, I wouldn't. I I may be average. I may be over okay. average uh, when you talk of type. But I just like to believe that anybody can be what that person wants to be. You can make yourself to gain what you want to achieve. You know, and by that I mean that there are people in your class that will go to class, they go home, they don't study. They grasp everything. There are people in your class, as you move from one class to the other, that will go and they will take notes and they have to read to be able to pass their exams. Some people will read for one hour, some will go for four days, some will go for 10 days to grasp the same thing that that person who doesn't read has grasped from the, from the class. Where do I put myself? I put myself towards the upper end that you grasp as you, as you, as you, as you take notes in class. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so I would, I, I would say that uh, the Almighty has been very fortunate to us to give us that uh, good memory to be able to grasp things and, 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 and keep things. And that led to probably a number of successes, you know, eventually through, I believe I was an A student through secondary school, an A student, uh, in fact, I went to university, in Jala University, when I was 22, at that time, during our time, you don't see many people at the age of 22 going to university. So take us through your alma maters from primary, secondary, through to university. You've started by mentioning Java. Well, let's start from your primary. Well, primary is St. Edward's, St. Edward's School, primary, secondary, and then uh, Njala University uh, later on. And after Njala University, uh, between, uh, I was at Njala between 1970 and 1974. 
And then I went for my master's at Birmingham University. I got an FAO fellowship at that time to go to Birmingham University in the UK. And that was a course on uh, genetic uh, conservation, conservation and utilization of plant genetic resources. And it was a one year program. You know, but by the time I finished the one year, my university was recommending that I should continue my PhD. You know, and they so wanted me to do that that eventually they agreed that I should come back home. And at that time, UK universities does not allow people to come back home to do their research. But they allowed me to come back home to do my research. So my research was done at uh, Rukupru, the Rice Research Station at Rukupru, uh, for my PhD. But I only went back six months before I attained the PhD just to do literature search, write my thesis, and of course uh, defend my thesis. You know, so I got my PhD in 1983. Growing up, what were your aspirations? Because like every other child, when you ask, some would say, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up. Others would say, I want to be a doctor, and so on and so on. When you were growing up, what were your aspirations? What did you always thought of becoming? What is most important, I believe, is that when you say you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, or you want to be whatever you, you, you plan, you must put some big meaning to it, even as a child. You know, because I believe that my, I have admired people, big people. I have admired different people in different categories and different classes at various levels. But I remember that my own vision came when I was in Form 2, Form 3 in secondary school. There was riot in, in Liberia. And the riot was so serious because it was due to shortage of rice. Like Liberia, like Sierra Leone, uh, uh, rice is their staple food. And uh, <laughs> I remember telling myself then, I must do everything I can in my life to produce food for my for people in Sierra Leone and Africa and the world. Because I could not believe what was ha happening at that time. And that riot led to overthrow of the government, and I believe that was when Samuel K. Do came into power. At that time, you were not born, I guess. Uh, I know you were not born at that time. But it gave me that vision that I must become an agriculturist to produce food for the world. So it's not a question of just saying it. It's a question of believing in it and work within that vision to pave your career path, to pave the path that you want to take in your life. Because if you want to be an agriculturist, what do you want to do? You want to study agriculture. If you want to study agriculture, you must get up to Form 5 and obtain your O-level certificate or A-level certificate to go to the university to do agriculture. So you see how it builds up. You go into several thresholds. First threshold, go through your 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 secondary uh, final year exam or the O-level certificate. The second threshold is to get a first degree. Your first degree to lead you to another threshold of becoming a, a, a postgraduate and getting a master's and then getting a PhD. So my aspiration to become an agriculturist led me to do agriculture general at Njala. It led me to do plant genetic resources at Birmingham University and plant genetics and bi uh, 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 biology at also at Birmingham University. And I am very proud that I did all of those things and I took this decision, even against some obstacles. I told you in my childhood, up to secondary school, I was a member of my church. I go to church every day and my priests at St. Ted was, at that time, we were hoping that this guy is going to become a priest. And my, I don't believe that was my daddy's aspiration for me, no. But um, it was not easy, somebody who grew up in Freetown, to go and tell his parents, at that time, I want to go to Njala to do agriculture, general. My daddy was like, what? What do you mean by that? 
don't you, you don't want to go to Fabi College to do engineering or mm -hmm. something? And eventually I said, no, I want to go to Njala. But when I succeeded in convincing my, my parents, I had to, my, my, my school, Father Martin, Bishop Broxnam, all those people were not happy with me because they said, we have embarked you to go for a priesthood training in Ireland. They thought that nation in Ireland, I would say, well, I would like to go out of the country, but no. I went to Ijala eventually. Even when one of them, I knew, I knew he was joking, he said, do you want to do agriculture to destroy the world? I said, no. <laughs> I want to do agriculture to feed the world. You know? So what I'm saying is that if you want to achieve something, you can always achieve it. But you have to make sure that you put everything to it, define your path, and then gradually walk towards that. You've mentioned a lot of priests mm -hmm. and your father being a religious person as you grew up. My mom too. Who would you say were your role models coming up? Well, uh, so many people will be my model, but let me, let me tell you something. I have grown up, like I said, in a happy home. And thanks to the Almighty, he gave me a lovely wife that has been with me. And I must say, and I'm not just saying it, We've been married for 40 years. We've known each other for uh, 44 years. And we've never had problems. We've always been together as a family. In fact, I have something that to walk to the home, to walk um, to sorry the home. To hold you, you talk there. about more well, than just I'm feels, When we say something good, you touch on wood. So that okay, I'll, 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 I'll touch, we'll touch on wood. We've wood. never touched. Yes, <laughs> we never had problems, and so it's been like a smooth lot. So if you ask me, my first model will be my wife, okay. because she's always been my backbone. She's always been there for me. She's always been there, like my parents to me. She's always been there for my children. In fact, sometimes I believe that. Um, um, my wife is always like the family. The family, the family, the family. The family always come first. For me too, they always come first. And uh, so she is my real model. And I would say that um, I look around today at my age, I believe in people who inspire people. And I believe in people who believe in what they want to do. And who believe that if I want to do this, I will um, achieve it. And I think we have such people within Sierra Leone today. And I'm not just saying it. I, will, I have worked with His Excellency the President of our country. He made me the presidential liaison on Ebola. Every trip he's made out of this country I've been with him. He traveled far and wide in every district, towns, cities, villages, to, to bring the sensitization message to people. And I believe that he did quite a lot. He's done quite a lot to bring us to where we are today. Today, by the way, we've got zero cases of uh, case of Ebola. And I think he played a, a major role. He is the model, he's the mentor of a good number of Sierra Leoneans, including myself. And uh, I will also, I can look out of my country, Sierra Leone, to say that um, I have seen great men, great women, great people, and that I believe that I would like to emulate. I would like to emulate what Obama has done for America, even though some Americans does not see that. I would like to emulate other people, but probably maybe I'll just stop there. <laughs> okay, well, um, aside all he has mentioned, he spoke about his wife, which feels good though, being a woman. You know the saying that um, behind every successful man, there's a woman? Well, I say beside every successful man, there is a woman. And Ambassador Professor Manti Patrick Jones has just proven that to you. One of his successes, 
is the kind of woman he married. So yes, of course, it's women, but not just any kind of woman. So you have to choose carefully who the woman is that would make a great input to your life. Now, Professor, let's come over to your achievements in life. Mm -hmm. What would you say are your greatest achievements in life, your biggest accomplishments? My biggest accomplishment? The one that, even if I'm asleep and you wake me up, I will say it's that one. Is the fact that I develop the Nerika rice. Nerika is the new rice for Africa. And um, I said it's my biggest achievement because I remember when I, well, I was working at the rice research station in Rukupu and I was made, although I just got my BS and went to, to Rukupu at that time, I was made to work with the breeding unit and in mangrove swamps. And when I looked around, the only variety that could do well under mild salinity conditions was the African indigenous rice species, which they call botanically is known as Oriza glabarima. But let's say it's the African indigenous species. But this rice, though it has got very good ability to suppress weeds and much higher level of resistance or tolerance of some of the major stresses that we find in rice cultivated areas in Africa, including upland, rain-fed lowland, irrigated system, and also mangrove swamps and other production systems. It has very low yields. Why is the Asian rice have got high yields, which means more grains per panicle? When we're talking of the Asian rice of uh, something like 250 grains per panicle, you're talking about 80 grains in the African rice. The Asian rice, by the way, is botanically known as Oriza sativa. So my vision at that time was to cross the African rice and the Asian rice to combine the high yield potential of the Asian rice and the adaptation, better resistance or tolerance, ability to suppress weed of the African rice into a new plant type. It has to be a new plant type because we're talking of uh, two different species of rice. People have been trying to do that for 50 years, but they were not successful. I started mine by meeting with renowned scientists at that time and talking to them, getting their own ideas, their failures, their successes, and I combined all. I even went to, um, to China because they were using some kind of uh, biotechnology, mild biotechnology, anti-culture work to combine genes of different species. So I spoke to them. And that gave me an idea of what to do. And eventually I succeeded in developing true to type varieties that combines the genome, the genes of the Asian rice and the African rice for the first time in the world. And that earned me the World Food Prize in 2004. World Food Prize because they said it was a major breakthrough for the past 25 years as far as agricultural science is concerned. And the, that means that it was the first time we've been able to achieve that. So for me, that is my greatest achievement. But they are, it followed with a lot of awards. In 2007, I was named by the uh, American, well, New York Times, as one of the hundred most influential persons of the world. And most influential if I persons can recall world. correctly, you are the only Sierra Leonean to have been in that category. I'm the only Sierra Leonean that have been in that category. And I was named, at the time I do not know who was named as well. I think it was President Bush at that time. You know, we were all in that category of hundred most influential persons in the world. Two years later in 2010, I got the Nigata Award, and uh, this is for breakthrough in food security in Africa, because at that time I was already working uh, as the Executive Director of the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, and that body is responsible for coordinating and facilitating agricultural research for development in the continent as a whole. And at that time, 
I was also named as the president of the Global Forum for Agricultural Research. So not only was I coordinating it for Africa, but I took leadership in the Global Forum for Agricultural Research. So we determined globally what type of research will be conducted. I remember that time we were talking of nine regions of the world, and we came up with a framework, a roadmap, that spells out what kind of research will be conducted in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, etc., etc. For that, the Japanese gave me the highest award of uh, 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 prize on food security. This is the prize that, uh, well, I got a prize, uh, but the symbol for the World Food Prize. And that is the symbol, and this is the symbol for the hundred, one of the hundred most influential persons in 2007. So all of these awards, coupled with, coupled with five, apart from my PhD, which is a Doctor of Philosophy in Plant Biology and Genetics, I got five honorary degrees, doctorate degrees, they call it doctorate causa, from five different universities in the world, from my alma mater from Jala University, Alma Meta, uh, Birmingham University in the UK, from Ghent University in, in Belgium, from uh, the University of the Free State in South Africa, and South African University again gave me one. The University of the Street added the professorship, and that's why I'm being called professor today. Professor. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones. Mm -hmm. Also, you're a very successful man. But what then would you say is the secret behind your successes? I think I've mentioned one. The secret behind my success is my wife, the backing that I'm getting from her. And I think uh, the secret behind it again is the dedication to duty. And I don't play with whatever I am given to do. And whether, whatever I'm given to do, I want it to be a success, and a big success. So if I'm given an assignment, or if I have an assignment, I make sure that I follow it up to the end, and make sure that it is successful. So that's dedication to duty, and the willingness to always be there to make sure that you end up with a success. It's the drive. It's always a drive within me. You know, even when I started, I came back home and started work at the State House, people would come to me to say, my goodness, you come to work so early. You know, because I believe that working time, at that time I didn't even know the working time, but from where I came from, where I was the executive director, I was always the first person to be in the office. Sometimes I leave my house at 6.30 to go to work, even though it's only about five, 10 minutes drive to work. This time I arrived at the state house usually at 7 30. You know, and except I have to go somewhere for a meeting or whatnot, I must be there until closing time uh, before coming home. So this kind of dedication, loyalty to the system, loyalty to your the person that you are responsible to, to be able to make sure that you give your best to the system to your boss, I think is always my drive and I will believe should be the drive of people in the world. Uh, want Professor, to yeah. you are a well celebrated man in the world when mm -hmm. it comes to agriculture and several other progressive aspects. Mm -hmm. And um, you've been receiving awards in Sierra Leone, of course, back from the days of our late president, for our late former president, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Jan Kaba. Mm -hmm. You've also received awards from President Anis Faiko mm -hmm. And now you are one of his special advisors. And you are the only special advisor to the president who is also an ambassador at large. Mm -hmm. And you're his special representative at NERC. Mm -hmm. How does all of this make you feel? It makes me feel good. It makes me feel that I am contributing something to my country. And you said all of this, but it is not too much for me, I'll tell you that. Because I always want to be busy. I always want to do even even uh, want to do something i always want to come up with good outputs and products you know and the more challenges you get 
the more my whiskers grow and the more I want to, I want to contribute. And even my colleagues that I'm working with have said, God, this guy is a workaholic. I don't believe that I'm a workaholic, although I spend my time mostly working. Because if you go, I have my study up and my documents are there. Before you got here, I was, I was working. You know, I, I go to bed very early because I know that I have to get up very early in the morning, sometimes 3 a.m., latest 4 a.m. I'm up and working before I go to begin to prepare for work. You know, so that's the way that I am. There are certainly young people who would be looking up to you right now as a role model. Mm -hmm. What does it take to be someone like Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones? I have looked up to people in my life and I've tried to get into their shoes even though sometimes my feet are small for their shoes. Uh, and I believe that this is a natural thing to do. Get people that you will single out to say, this person has contributed in a positive way to their country, to the world, to their region, etc. And then try to emulate them. But I would say to young people today, by the way, I believe in the youth as much I, as I believe in gender equity and uh, 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 women's affairs and things like that. As much as I believe in promoting vulnerable groups, no matter what category, and I believe that a short period that I've been here, been able to demonstrate that uh, with all of these groups, because I've met with all of them and I've tried to talk to them to help them in various ways, which we probably may not go into in this in this uh, discussion. But I think that um, young people in particular the youth, should have a purpose in life. They should come up with their vision, even at secondary school level, and work their path to achieve that vis vision. Be dedicated to what you do to achieve your vision in life. And I believe, like what I said earlier on, no matter your level of grasping teams in class. Don't be discouraged. Perseverance will take you to where you want to go. And this is the message that I have for the young, that the youths that are coming up, that try to pay, get your vision, pave your way to achieve that vision. And if it doesn't work, don't give up. Because there is something for everybody in this world. I believe that you can get what you want to get through perseverance. I've mentioned that and I'm repeating it. Because I believe that if you want to be a doctor, coming to your first question or your earlier question, or if you want to be a lawyer, and for some reasons you couldn't make it, nobody says that you cannot do something useful that will benefit you that will make you take care of your family tomorrow and that will benefit the country. You can decide to be manufacturing belts. You can decide to be putting uh, shoes together. Take it that you decide that I want to create belts. Do everything to be, building your, to be making your belts. Think of it of, for Sierra Leone. Think of sending your belts outside Sierra Leone to the Mano River Union countries, for the sub-region, to ECOWAS, for the region, to Africa, to the world. You can be even better than the PhD doctor that you wanted to be by just that. So just concentrate, concentration that this is what I want to do and I'm going to do it, start small, Grow, grow, until it becomes big. It has happened in the world. Some of the key people that you have today did not start big. They start small. But that vision 
to be big. Let them to, be, to become big people today. You need to find out how people like, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't mention him, Dangote and all of these people, how they started to get to where they are today. And that is the way that people should think. And uh, so I believe that our youths can be relevant in this system. Our youths can play a key role to drive the economic growth of our country. Because it is your responsibility to do that. It is your responsibility, no matter your affiliation. Because I know that we have various religious groups, we have various, uh, I don't want to bring politics into it, politics, uh, political parties and all of those things, and people are affiliated to one group or the other. But your contribution to your co country is your responsibility. And this is my advice to the youth, that they should contribute, regardless of affiliation. Contribute, contribute so that you make better yourself and your family, and contribute so that you contribute to the economic growth of your country. Uh, Professor, as we wrap up, there are certain young people, well, I'll say for you to start with, mm -hmm. you've traveled far and wide. Mm -hmm. There are certain young people who probably don't have the upper hand financially, mm -hmm. and but they only think that the best way for them to succeed, or the only way for them to succeed, is if they travel out of the country. Mm -hmm. What would you say to this category of young people? I know people like to see places. And I know people like to go places and, 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 and get a feel of what is happening at the other side. Um, and it is becoming even dangerous to want to go when you are not ready, to want to go when you are not invited. Because you must have heard of shipwreck, you know, in the Mediterranean, people trying to cross from North Africa to Italy and other places. It's becoming very dangerous to do that. If you are lucky and you are invited or you get the fellowship or you get work permit to go and if you feel that that is the way you're going to live your life, fine, you can go. But I will tell you, you can equally make it back home in Sierra Leone. And... Uh, I told you of my priest that wanted me to go to Ireland after my O-levels to become a priest. If I wanted to go at that time, I would have gone. What would have happened to me today, I don't know. Uh, not that it's wrong to be a priest. I, I like religion. I still pray quite a lot. But I believe that today I am contributing to my country. Even when I was, with 30 years that I was out, I was still contributing to Sierra Leone, always contributing to Sierra Leone, because I was initiating programs in various fields, supporting institutions, because I had the ability to do that at that time. Because my organization, the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, solicits resources, and we support agricultural research programs for the 50 55 countries in, 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 in Africa, including Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone was my country and I had to make sure that Sierra Leone gets a little bit more than other countries. So I was still contributing. But I believe that you can make it back home. I didn't go, coming to that, I didn't go. I stayed back, got my, my, my uh, BSc in Agriculture General, and God just opened the way for me from there. I believe it can happen to anybody, regardless of whatever you are doing, whether you are studying, whether you are working, whether you are just a shoemaker or a belt creator or whatever. People might recognize you across the world for just doing that. So I would say that don't be in a hurry to go out. You can still make it inside your own country, even if you go out still contribute to the development of your country because at the end of the day you may want to come back to your country and you want to meet a beautiful a continued beautiful Sierra Leone it's a beautiful country the weather is just fantastic you know 
And this country has everything that it takes to be a successful country, to be a, a, a country that could serve as a model for the world or for Africa. I say so because how many small countries like Sierra Leone have got the kind of minerals that we've got? Whether it's diamond, gold, bauxite, rutile, iron ore, how many small countries have got this type of climatic conditions? Nine major rivers, three minor ones, all almost cutting across the country. Rainfall in excess of eight months in the year for 260 days. You can grow whatever you want to grow. This, I believe, is the vision of His Excellency the President to build this country. And we started doing it before Ebola struck. You know, and he just mentioned that we're going to go back to where we were and we're going to continue growth from there. Professor, you've seen things in life. You've been to places, you've been with people. Do you have any experiences, any lessons you've learned in life, probably about relationship with people or about things that you want to share with our viewers? One thing that I would like to tell our viewers, and particularly the youths, I'm always coming back to the youth because they are the future of this country. Don't be in a hurry to move on in life. Go slowly to achieve your goals. When you are in a hurry to say, oh, I should be in a hurry, I must make money, you end up doing the wrong things to make money. Go slowly. The Almighty Himself will guide you to achieve your goals and objectives. Go slowly. Don't step on the toes of people to achieve what you want to achieve. Just be nice to people. I'm not saying that you should allow people to take advantage of you. I am saying that be true to yourself. Be true to the people that, are, that surround you. Be, truth, be truthful to your nation. And you will achieve everything that you want to achieve in this world. Thank you very much, Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones, for having us in your house and being a part of this program. That was Ambassador Professor Monty Patrick Jones. He is a special advisor to our president, Dr. Ernest Baikoma. And amongst the three advisors to the president, he's the only advisor who is also ambassador at large. And he's also the president's special representative at NERC, that's our National Ebola Response Center. You've been watching Leave Your Dreams on Star TV Network, it's Channel 21. I have been Fabian Swill and it's been my pleasure hosting this program for you. This program that tells you no is not an option. You can be anything you want to be in life, as long as you work hard towards achieving it. Stay tuned to our channel.